All right. Is everybody ready? Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, we're hopping into Hebrews. So if you want to grab your Bibles, um, we're going to get there in about 15 minutes. Okay. So if you're like, well, that's a long time. Um, it's because this is the intro sermon to the whole series. And so I'm going to actually spend the first half of my um, sermon kind of re- reminding us of why we do what we do here at New Hope and why we teach through books of the Bible, okay? So that's going to be the first half of my message. Then we'll get into Hebrews chapter 1. If you're wondering, boy, he, is he ever going to get there? Yeah, we'll get there, all right? We'll be doing chapter 1 today, and uh, next week we'll hop into chapter 2. So, um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll get there in just uh, a few minutes. So, uh, you know, I've talked about this, you know, in the past, and, and some of this of what I'm going to be preaching on here at the first first half. It's just going to be a refresher for a lot of those of you who are regulars here at New Hope, um, and that's good. Sometimes we need reminding of why we do what we do. Can I get an amen on that? Because sometimes, you know, life just throws us curveballs. Sometimes, you know, we just get tired. Sometimes um, we drift, and, uh, and it's good to come back to center and be reminded of, of some of the key things and, and why we do what we do. Has anybody ever felt clueless in a conversation before? Yeah. Do we have any, any of you, like, that's just your life? You, you just feel like, you're like, you know, like every day, I don't know what anybody's talking about. I'm just, yeah, sometimes I wish that was me, because I think you just smile a lot. You know, that's what you do. You're like, you know, just, just walk around just smiling. Like I, and you don't have to worry about things, because you don't even know what they're talking about. I mean, I'm telling you, when I get old and need hearing aids, they're going to be off all the time. I'm just going to be smiling. I'm not going to be listening to anybody. Just going around smiling. Do we have anybody like that already? You don't have to raise your hand because your hearing aids are off, right? You're already going to... Pastor Tim's on. <laughs> Turn them down, all right? Um, but we feel that way sometimes, just clueless in conversations, things that are overhead, things we don't know about, things, you know, for me, it's sports. You can, you know, I, to me, it's like sports ball, you know, like I don't know what... You know, I, I didn't grow up knowing a lot about sports, and, and so there's things like that that we get overwhelmed by. And if you're a new Christian, you know, you, you show up to a church, and they say, hey, read your Bible, and it's like, what am I supposed to read? And so you, like, start at the beginning, and, and then you get to, like, Leviticus, and you're like, is this what I'm supposed to be reading? Like, these genealogies, and, like, who begot who, and then all these rules and laws, and, like, am I supposed to be doing this and not doing this? And I didn't know about this, and it's like, it can be overwhelming, right? Anybody ever feel that way about the Bible? Right? It can be overwhelming. And so I want us to understand, just as we start a new series in a new book, um, what the Bible is so that we can understand where we're at in the, in the whole story of the Bible and the importance of, of understanding the full story from beginning to end of what the Bible's all about as we dig into uh, you know, certain chapters and certain books that we teach on here at New Hope. Um, but here's kind of an overarching point. If you want to fill in the blanks, so you have your worship programs, um, you can fill in the blanks on these things and follow along that way if you enjoy uh, doing that. Um, but this is, this is kind of the first point. The Bible is God's story, and it reveals God to me, and it reveals me to me. Okay? So that's what the Bible is. It's God's story from the beginning of creation um, to when he's returning and putting everything back to his dream in the first creation, okay? And so it is God's story, and, and in it we learn about who God is. And uh, we're going to see in the book of Hebrews, we get to learn about who God is through Jesus, because Jesus is the direct, um, how, how do I say it, impression of God. Like everything we see in the life of Jesus that we just read about in the book of Mark, like we saw Jesus in human flesh, and, uh, and then he died, and he rose again, and now he's in his glorified self. He's back in heaven where he is going to be, and then we're—I'm getting too much into it. All right, so, so anyways, um, so it, we see God. It reveals God to us, but it reveals me to me. This is the beautiful thing about the Word of God. It is living. It's active. It's not just like a book you read once and like, oh, yeah, I know about that, right? And then you just move on. Every time you read it, the Holy Spirit, God himself, starts revealing who you are, and, and he shows parts about your life that need to grow and change. And that's this beautiful thing about when you read scripture. Like, I've read the Bible a lot in my life, and still I'll go back to a chapter and a verse I've read over and over and over again, all of a sudden it's like, Phew! it's like a brand new light gets lit up on that verse that I didn't understand before. And it shows something about me that I need to grow. And it's like, what is this? And it's the work of the Holy Spirit with God's word in us. It's so awesome and powerful, okay? So that's what the Bible is. It's God's story, 
It reveals God to us as we read it. We understand that. And it reveals us to us, right? And, and uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 is one of those you know, verses that gets used a lot about the Bible because it's true. All Scripture is God-breathed, meaning all of Scripture is God's word. He breathed it, okay? And so Scripture is God-breathed. It is useful for teaching, for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Why? So that the servant of God, that's all of us as Christ followers, may be thoroughly equipped so having everything you need for every good work. So do you think we should spend time in it, right? Like that's, that's a big thing there, that when we're in God's word, God breathes it into us and, uh, and we are taught things, we get rebuked, which is okay. Like that's the me to me stuff. It's like God reveals to me things I need to grow in. It's like, oh, oh, I need to be corrected, put back in alignment with him and training in righteousness what it looks like to live a godly right life so that I may be thoroughly equipped for the good works that God has prepared for me for you for all of us to do and so the scripture is a big deal that's why uh, here at New Hope this is not a self-help church okay we don't preach sermons that just make you feel good and then you leave and then and you could have read it on the internet, you know, or you could have watched Dr. Phil or Oprah or whatever. Like, like there's plenty of self-help stuff out there and um, all of it is behavior modification, which means it's just telling you to live a little bit differently and you'll live your best life now kind of stuff. And that's not how it works. The Holy Spirit, God himself, doesn't just like force us to change. He transforms us from the inside out. It's more like a butterfly in a cocoon. You were this, and now you're this. And it's, it's God and his word and his spirit working in you to transform you. And that's a journey, okay? Don't expect that to be, boy, I'm going to bed a caterpillar, and I look kind of weird and slimy, and I'm going to wake up like a butterfly, like the next day. It's like, that's not how it works, but when we spend the time and God spends his time with us and we spend our time with him, it is a journey of transformation. And it's a beautiful thing. Amen. Can I get an amen, amen on that? Anybody experience that? All right. Um, and it doesn't end until we get to see him face to face. It is a lifelong journey. It, this book that we read, the Bible, God's breathed word to us, it convicts us, it instructs us, it inspires us. We can study it, we can meditate on it, we can memorize it, but we have to apply it, right? We've got to put it into action. I want to challenge us because I'm going to talk about in, in Hebrews 1, like two extremes that people can go in. Um, and one of the warnings in Hebrews was to be careful to not go to one of these two extremes. But I, I want us to be careful that studying God and studying the Bible is not just something to be investigated and understood. This isn't a textbook. This is about someone to be known and loved. It's about a person, okay? And so it's like you're reading the love letter from the person that already proved his love for you. It's not like, okay, here's the rule book and I'm gonna memorize the rules so that I can look good. No, 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 that's legalism, right? Um, yes, we wanna know it. Yes, we wanna investigate. Yes, we wanna study. Yes, we wanna understand. But it's not about just knowledge, right? It's about relationship. Does that make sense? And so when we study the Bible, it's always in, in alignment with how does this affect our relationship with this Heavenly Father that has already shown all the love to us, okay? So let's be careful when we study that we have that right heart attitude, that we want to know it, understand it, but we want to know it so that we can deepen our relationship with God and learn how to love others because those were the two greatest commandments we just learned in the book of Mark, Right? The two greatest commandments are what? Love God and love people, right? Yeah, how are you doing on that? That's, that's God's will for your life. <laughs> Just loving God, loving others. I love how simple that is because ask yourself at the end of the day, did I love God? Did I love people? I'm doing all right, right? <laughs> you know, like, um, even if I messed up a little bit, you know, I'm doing all right. Okay, so let's, I, I want to help us understand the Bible real quick, okay? So the Bible it was written over a period of 1,500 years. That's a long time, right? Um, so it's one big collected book of a bunch of different books inside of it. Um, so it's full of 66 separate books in the Bible. And there were over 40 writers, those who wrote um, the Bible, but there was really only one author. Who's the author? God himself, right? We just learned that. All scripture is God-breathed. That the Holy Spirit 
was present in all of this. How do I know that? Well, I, I think about it this way. Um, well, I'll, I'll get there in a second. When you think about like the books and the writers, like the, the, the number of writers in this, there were, there were politicians, there were farmers, there were prophets, there were shepherds, there were peasants, there were musicians and poets, tax collectors, fishermen, doctors. There's a lot of different type of people that wrote these books. And yet all these different writers over a 1,500-year period of time wrote one story. Isn't that crazy? Like, I, I always use the illustration. If you've been here in New, New Hope, you've heard me use this illustration. But imagine if I got, like, five different authors together and said, hey, I want you guys to all write a book together. And we're planning on it being a bestseller. I mean, it's going to be the best-selling book ever. Everybody's going to buy it. Everybody's going to know about it. And this is what I want you to do. I want all five of you to, for the next, you know, just year, the next year, write your part of the book. But don't talk to each other. Don't have any conversation with one another. Just You guys just go off in your cabins and go off to your lake houses and go wherever and just write your part of a book. And when we're done after that year, we're just going to take each of your parts and put it together. What is the likelihood of that book making any sense? None. Right? Nothing. Like you have like five people, different ideas, different types of writers, different experiences. Like it's not going to make sense. It's going to be a bad book. It's not going to be a bestseller. I guarantee it, right? Um, so the likelihood of 40 writers writing 66 books and it being one story, this is how we know God is the author, inspired by the Holy Spirit in these writers who gave their eyewitness testimonies. They gave prophecies of what was going to happen, and those prophecies come true hundreds of years later after they are dead and gone, right? We see the proof in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and how it all works together. It's full of genealogies and history, so we can see even scientifically and look historically, these things actually happened in history. There are parables, which is storytelling. There's prophecy. There's poetry. There's letters to the early church and leaders. So there's different types that still all say the same thing. It's awesome. It's an amazing thing that God has given us in the scriptures and we have more access today than any point in history. I mean, y'all have this, right? Like, I can have the Bible, and I don't know, like, thousands of languages right here on my phone. Do you know how many I can read? One. So I use one, all right? <laughs> but we have unlimited, the crazy access. There's still people, though, on this planet that do not have access, and they're working really hard translating it into these, like, native languages of these tribes that have never had a written language. It's only been verbal. Like, imagine the work that's being done right now to translate the scriptures. It's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome of what's happening. The other part of this picture is this book was also written between 13 different countries over three continents in Asia, Africa, and Europe. It was written in three different languages. The Old Testament, primarily in Hebrew. We see in the New Testament, Greek, Aramaic. And, um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot to the Bible. There's a lot for us to learn and understand about the Bible. Now, with all of that, uh, one of the questions we get quite often, um, and in, in the past, churches had pretty strong opinions about this discussion, but it's what version then should I read? Because there are a, a lot of English versions of the Bible, Right? And you'll have some camps that say, it's this one, it's only, this is the holy word of God. And it might be like the KJV, right? The King James Version. It's interesting, King James wasn't there when Jesus was walking, okay? Um, and I'm pretty sure if it's English, it's not the word of God because it was originally written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, which is the only original word of God, okay? So any other language, it is going to be a translation because that's not the original. Does that make sense? So if you want the holiest go learn Greek, go learn Hebrew, learn a little bit of Aramaic, and study it and parse it out on your own, okay? And there's some people that do that. There's some people that love that kind of stuff. That's awesome. Go for it. Like, enjoy it. I, me, I use technology. So I click a button, I click a word, and it gives me all of that, okay? Like, I can click on one word in my Bible software. It gives me the original language, gives me where it's quoted all throughout the Bible, and like, which is awesome. So technology is pretty cool to do that. Um, but what do we use? So I want to explain, and I've done this in the past, 
Um, the different versions that you might see if you go to a bookstore, you go to Walmart, to the Bible department, or if you see different versions, we have free Bibles here in the back. Um, why do we have all these English versions, okay? And, and what does this look like? What are the differences in translations? And so um, we have it on the big screen too, so you can see a little bit better. But, but there's kind of a, a spectrum here on the different ways that the passages from the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic were translated into English. Over here on the far left, we have what was done, which was word-for-word -word translation. They, they went to the original language, and they tried to word-by-word -word translate that word directly into an English word. So it was word-by-word, -word, tried to mean as accurate as possible. Now, is it going to be 100% accurate? No, because there's ways that those languages work that English doesn't work that way, right? And so, um, but it's the closest... Um, equivalents, formal equivalents to the original language. So down here on this end, you would have those word-for-word -word translations like the NASB, which is what I use, I use for study, and we actually have NASB uh, Bibles back there if you want to free one of those, which is all the way down here on the spectrum of a word-by-word. -word. You have also like, that stands for New American um, Standard Bible, okay? ESV, the English um, uh, Standard Version, KJV, New King James is down here. So these are more word-by-word -word translations. Does that make sense? So if you're doing like deeper study type stuff, I would encourage you stay down here on the word-for-word -word end, okay? Um, it'll be more in alignment with the original and then go to the original and go to Hebrew and Greek and all that fun stuff if you uh, feel like you want to do that. So here in the middle, we have a meaning for meaning. So it's closest natural equivalents. Um, the only one we have here is the, I think that's God's word translation. It's kind of like right in the middle between a word for word and a thought for thought. Um, so it's, it's kind of close to the word for word. And then you move to this next kind of area, which is a thought for thought translation. So this is where they would take the idea of that sentence or that phrase or whatever it is and take that thought and translate that into English or into the language that they're trying to do. So they're trying to make it more um, easy to read, right, in the language, which down here you'll see kind of in the middle of that one is NIV, the New International Version, which is usually what we teach from here at New Hope. It's what I use mostly to teach from is the NIV, it's accurate, there's, a, there's great accuracy there, but it's not a word for word, but it gives a great thought for thought. So this would be a good like personal study type stuff. Like if you're just reading the Bible and just kind of want to understand it, it makes it understandable. Does that make sense? Okay, so then you go from thought to thought all the way down to the end, which is a paraphrase. A paraphrase is basically a person's retelling of that passage. So it's really filtered through their own thoughts and ideas about that passage, and then saying it words that just really simplify it. And on the far end you see down there is, is probably one that's the most popular, which is the Message Bible, right? The Message by Eugene Peterson, where he takes it, and it's really cool. Like, if you're read, studying down here, and you're like, I don't quite understand that, to go and read the message version and be like, oh, that makes a lot of sense because you use like just really just kind of blunt English and concepts that just help you may, may help you be like, oh, that helped me understand that a little bit better concept. And so, so that's just kind of the spectrum of versions of the Bible. Is this helpful? Does this make sense? And I know, you know, every time I do this, there's people who may be new to New Hope and they're like, I didn't know any of that. Thank you for explaining that, right? And so hopefully this is helpful uh, for you. If you want to take a screenshot of that, you can with your phone or whatever. But, but that's why for us, we kind of hang out way over here on the NASB and over here at the NIV. That's what we typically use here at New Hope when we're studying and when we're preaching and teaching. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of different versions, but those are the two that uh, we've decided to hang out at. Now, I wish I had time to do this today, but I don't. This is the whole Bible, okay? So if you wonder what the whole story of the Bible is, it starts with creation and moved to brokenness. We're given promise through Abraham, right? God promised Abraham something, and then we move to the law with Moses, where we're given the law, and then we see the Jews in the Old Testament then led to rebellion, and they kept on the cycle of rebellion and coming back to God, rebelling and coming back to God. That's the whole rest of the Old Testament, by the way, all right? So like, if you read it, that's what's going on, because it shows the heart condition of man. That's all of us, right? And, and we see ourselves through the Old Testament, and then it moves to this beautiful thing when Jesus shows up, right? When Jesus shows up, this new thing called grace enters into our story, where God fully reveals his grace. Grace is all through here, just so you know. God's character never changed. 
but now we see it in the person of Jesus. And that grace then, when Jesus went back up, we live in the time of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit now is indwelling into all believers in Christ. And that's where we live, and we're waiting for what? The last is eternity, the book of Revelation. We're waiting for Jesus to come back because the end of all things is bringing it back to what he wanted in creation, where we relate with God and each other, and in creation with perfect unity, with no more sin and brokenness. Like that was the dream in the garden, and he brings it back at the end. There you go, the whole Bible. That was quick and easy, wasn't it? Now, if you want to hear that whole sermon, <laughs> okay, um, go to mynewhope.tv forward slash Bible, okay? Mynewhope.tv forward slash Bible. I think I put it in your worship programs. That, that uh, link is there, and those online, you can write it down. But that takes you to the point in the sermon last year where I preached through the whole Bible and preached through all of this story because the whole story of the Bible is God's rescuing us. Sin entered in and brokenness came in. We all live in brokenness and sin. We all need a Savior, that Savior came in the person of Jesus Christ who rescued us from our sin and is redeeming us to bring us back into perfect fellowship with him in eternity. That is the whole story of God. And it's a beautiful story. And so when we look and we go into like a book of the Bible, we see where it fits into the whole story, right? We we're in the book of Mark uh, as we wrap that up and we were reading about this season of grace coming, Right? We saw Jesus, how he lived, what he did, how he walked, who he healed, how he healed them, and then what he did finally on the cross in resurrection. That is when grace entered into the story. And now we're reading the book of Hebrews, which is after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Jesus is in heaven, and that's where he's at right now, waiting and preparing, building his church. And so the book of Hebrews is in this timeline of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so we, yeah, it's really cool. We get to dig into the book of Hebrews together. And we kind of moved from reading about Jesus or reading uh, and learning from the eyewitness accounts of how he walked, how he lived. And now the book of Hebrews is kind of like the, the what and the why, right? Like Jesus, like what is he and why did he do that? Where is he now? What does that mean for us? So, oh man, this book is just a rich, deep, thick book, okay? So if you like good, deep, rich stuff, this is it, all right? <laughs> this is it. All right, so that's all my intro. You guys ready now? Ready. So let's hop into Hebrews. Um, so this is what I want you to do. Um, if, if you haven't grabbed one of these, last week we had one on every single seat. Every single series we create these, it's a, it's a series guide. And the series guide on the front has this thing that we help you get to spend time with Jesus, all right, spend time with God, and it's called the SOAP method. You, you read the scripture that's on the back, whatever that scripture is. Um, o is uh, observation. You write down, ask the Holy Spirit, what, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to show me about God? What are you trying to show me about me, right? And so you write that down. Um, a is application. Well, what does that mean f- for me to do? What should I do this week? What does that look like in my life? How do I put action to this? And then P is prayer. You spend time in prayer with God. God loves hearing from you. He loves knowing how you're doing. He, he loves, you know, he loves you talking to him. And, um, and so this is just a tool to do that with. On the back is the reading plan. So little check boxes. You can read it. Check the box. If that makes you happy. A little thing goes off in your head like, yeah, I did something right. Like, go for it. Check the boxes. Gamify it. I don't care. All right. Um, if you need a bell sound, put one on your phone, check the box, go ding, and train yourself, right? Okay. Um, however you want to do it. Uh, and on the bottom, we have these things called memory verses, right? Because we want to memorize scripture, put it in our head so it moves to our heart and moves to our hands. It affects how we live and what our life looks like. Now, if you haven't seen these, we've, we've had these for a long time. Um, if you like that SOAP method, at the Welcome Center, we've got actual physical journals. If you're the person that loves like actually physically writing stuff, awesome. Um, these have the SOAP method built into the journal. It also, in the front of it, it has a reading plan. If you actually want to read through the whole Bible in a year, it's got the plan in it where you can check those boxes and make yourself feel good about life, right? So like, if you love doing that, you can grab one of those. Um, we sell these, so, uh, and we sell them at cost. We don't make any money on these. So I think these spiral bound ones were $5, I believe. And these are a little bit fancier. Hardcover ones are $10. So those are at the Welcome Center. If you want to buy a life journal and do it that way, 
you have something physical in your hand as you do it, um, you can buy those and, and yeah, spend time, with, spend time with Jesus every single morning. It'll change your day, I promise you. It'll change your day. It's a good place to start with. Um, so this is the first memory verse for this series, Hebrews 4.16. And so we're just going to read this out loud together. All right, is everybody ready? All right, here we go. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Have you ever had a time of need? (laughs) Yesterday? You know, like when did you have a time of need, right? Like, so we have this awesome thing. We get to approach God's throne of grace with what? Confidence. Like you don't have to go like, you know, like scared or whatever, like because of Christ. That's what we're going to, we're going to see a lot of this is because of Christ. We get to come to the throne of, of grace, and we get to receive mercy. We find grace there, and he gives us help. He helps us in our time of need. It's, it's a beautiful thing. So, um, so that's the memory verse. I talked about the series guide. Let's hop into it. We're going to read um, Hebrews chapter 1, the whole chapter. I'm not going to make you stand this morning um, as we read it since we're kind of halfway through the message because I know you're settled and you have your notes out and you have your pen and your paper and all that stuff. But let's, we honor God's word here, right? Amen. Okay, so let's stand in our hearts, shall we? Um, so yeah, so I'm going to read uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 1 and, uh, and then we'll dig into it today. So here we go. Hebrews chapter 1. Sorry, in verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But then in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels spirits, and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, You laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To the angels, oh, to which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits? sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? He ends with a question, which we'll go into chapter two. So God, this is your word. It is good, it is true. It's you breathing in us by your spirit, God. We want to understand your word. And today, whatever you want to speak to each of us, prepare us, soften our hearts, Clear our minds and let us understand so that we can grow, we can learn, we can be transformed. We know that only comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, speak. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 So now we get into the intro of Hebrews. I, I'm telling you, like this morning's message, I was like, okay, where do I go with this? Because literally, like the book of Hebrews, we could go word by word on the book of Hebrews. <laughs> like, I, I could just like, let's do verse one, and we're going to hang out there for the next five weeks. Like, we could do that, okay? Just so you know how deep and rich it is. Um, but today I'm doing the whole chapter. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of give some overarching things. So here's some things about the book of Hebrews, okay? Um, you know, we study 
Other books, a lot, a lot of the books we see in the New Testament were letters written by Paul to certain churches, right? It's from Paul to the church in blah, 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 Corinth or, you know, Ephesus. Or, and so a lot of Paul's letters would start that way. It would be greetings, and at the end it would be like, you know, greet these people, and it would be very specific, and you would know who it's from and who it's to and all that kind of stuff. The book of Hebrews is written a little bit differently. So the book of Hebrews, we don't actually know who the author is, Tradition would say it was Paul. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of tend to disagree as I studied it a little bit more because of the language that's used in the book of Hebrews. It's like a very precise language used in the book of Hebrews. And it's written differently than the rest of, the, of Paul's letters, okay? And um, some people think it might have been Apollos, like you, we read about Apollos in other parts of the scripture. We don't know is, is the answer. We don't know. But we do know in it there is such rich, deep truth about Jesus. And, um, and so we're not supposed to know the, uh, who the writer was. We know who the author is. His name is God, right? <laughs> like, God wrote this. Um, we know it was most likely to Jewish believers, hence Hebrews, right? It was written to those who were being persecuted and going through a lot of struggles because there's lots of encouragements and exhortations throughout the book of Hebrews that would seem to be focused on Jewish believers. Um, imagine in, in this point of history, it was before 70 AD. So this is the early church. How do we know it's before 70 AD? Because the author or the writer talks about the temple still being there. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, just as Jesus predicted it would. And, and so we know that's the time frame that it was. So this is like early, early history here. This is early writings. Um, that we read in here. So imagine being a Jew, grew, growing up as a Jew, doing all the things that you were supposed to do, living amongst all the rules and regulations and the laws, going to the temple so many times, doing this many sacrifices, celebrating the Sabbath. I mean, that, that was what they had to do, right? It was very, you know, legalistic and ritualistic, pointing towards God. And all of those things that they were doing were pointing towards Jesus, that's all it was. All of the Old Testament, you see these things that they had to do, and it pointed to a perfecter of those things. And it's Jesus. He fulfilled all of what they were doing. So if you grew up as a Jew, that's what you believed. We have to do all this stuff. Now you find out Jesus was the Messiah. And you make a decision that I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior and proclaiming he is the Messiah. And yet you're still connected relationally and community to the temple and to the whole life and your whole family of what you've done as a Jew. Would there be tensions attached to that? Oh, yeah. Some of you in this room have become Christ followers at the detriment of, of the things you've experienced in your family because they think you're a fool and you've been ostracized or you get talked bad about because like, oh, you go to church or you da-da-da-da-da, right? It's the same thing. They were like, Pfft. and so they were receiving persecution from their own families and their own community for becoming a believer. That's the word that they would use. They're a believer in Jesus. And so they would be um, persecuted because of that. So imagine that persecution coming at you as a Jewish believer now, calling you back. Come back to the rules. Come back to the temple worship. Come back to all the laws. And you're hearing that all the time. And then on the other spectrum, you have uh, all the people who see you in the middle and, and they're persecuting you because you're a Christian and they're worldly and it's coming at you that way. Like, oh, are you a fool? Whatever, do this. And then like, so you're having these persecutions coming in from both sides, trying to pull you one way or another. Hmm. I was struggling with what book we were supposed to study after the book of Mark. And we had some conversations on our teaching team. We kind of went back and forth, and there were a lot of different options. And uh, we were going to do First and Second Corinthians and start that this fall. And there was just something in me that I'm like, I don't. I, I was the Holy Spirit prodding, and if it was bad pizza the night before, I don't know what it was. But <laughs> you have to determine these things, right? Like, um, but the more I'm looking at the looked at the Book of Hebrews, the more I'm like, this is the season we're in. Um, culturally, this might be a season you were in personally. Um, we just finished the book of Mark. We, we learned how Jesus lived. And here's some things I know about you. 
you will face hard decisions. At some point, maybe you're in the middle of some hard decisions. Um, you're going to have difficult relationships, most likely. Um, you're going to have worldly and cultural pressures pushing in however way they can into your life. You're about to have political unrest be shoved down your throat. All of those things can shake you and your faith. Whether it's coming from family or from work or from friends or from classmates at school or news or media or politicians or lawmakers or YouTubers or influencers, there are plenty of voices in this world, right? And we, we honestly, just to be honest, we allow too many voices into our life too often throughout our week. Even though they make us feel like crap, we still allow it. And then we blame them. It's our fault. We turn it on. We scroll through it. We look at it. We, we, if we put crap in our life, do you know what's going to come out? Thank you. Right? Crap in, crap out. Stress in, stress out. Right? Lies in, lies out. You all don't even know what you're talking about sometimes. You, I heard, and then I'm t- I guarantee you about half of what you said that came out of your mouth was not true, right? But you didn't know it, but you heard, so you said it. It's like, why do we do that? Why do we do that? Why? Because it's there. Because these pressures are there from both sides. There's some Christians that are telling you to be way more Christian. You're not Christian enough. And there are some people saying, you're being too Christian. <laughs> or, or my God wouldn't do that. Or you know what I'm saying? We have it on all sides. And the thing that comes through the whole book of Hebrews that we need to just, I don't know, maybe even if you like tattoos, maybe get this one, all right? Don't, don't say, Pastor Tim told me I got to get a tattoo. And some of you believe some things about tattoos. You're going to be like, oh, that's, that's irreligious. And I'm like, I don't think this one would be. Jesus is greater. That's the bottom line of the book of Hebrews. All of that, all the pressures, all the stuff, all the weirdness, all the relationships, all the lies, all the influence, all the, it, in everything that you're going to experience, the bottom line of the book of Hebrews is this. Jesus is greater. Can you all say that with me? Jesus is greater. He is greater. All throughout the book of Hebrews, these are the words that get used. Better, 11 times. Jesus is better than. Superior, that's kind of, that's it. (laughs) Four times. Greater than, seven times. This is the key theme of the whole book of Hebrews. Jesus is greater. You're going to face stuff. We're going to face stuff. But we, I want us to learn over these next, I think it's 15, 16 weeks, I want it to just penetrate and transform our hearts, our minds, and our lives. This fact, Jesus is greater. There are so many challenges, and, and I'm, I'm pre-preaching the sermon. There are so many challenges that we see, exhortations, which are like words of encouragement and challenge, okay? And here's just a few of them that are in this book that we're going to learn. Uh, 2.1 says, pay careful attention. Pay more careful attention. It also says, do not drift away. 3.6, hold on to courage and hope. 3.12, do not turn away from the living God. 4.14, hold firmly to the faith we profess. 6.1, go on to maturity. 10.35, do not throw away your confidence. 10.39, do not shrink back. 12.1, run with perseverance. Jesus is greater. And my hope and my prayer for us in this series is that we will take great encouragement that our foundations of our faith will grow stronger and deeper, that we will be swayed less by the world or swayed less by things that aren't Jesus, and that we will look more and more like heaven every day. That's my hope as we get into this book. Now, I've got three minutes. Yeah, whatever. Um, (laughs) I told, I told the worship team, I'm like, I only have like 16 slides. I normally have like 24. I'm like, oh, this is going to be a short one. All right. 
So that's my hope. Does that sound good to you guys? Does that sound like, yeah, you would agree with that's where we're at and that's, that's probably what we need? Okay. Um, if not, then just you can plug your ears and turn off your hearing aids. So here we go. <laughs> Let's just read and study this real quick, okay? I'm just only reading the first four verses and then the last verse of this as we kind of unpack this because I could spend hours on this. So this is what it says. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. So in the past, so we read that in the Old Testament, right? The prophets were God's mouthpiece to his people, and so God would have these prophets show up and be like, you got to go tell the people this. The prophets were not popular, okay? The prophets were like, we're the ones trying to call people back to God, call the Jews back to God, call the kings back to God. Like, that's what the prophets were doing. So we see that there were um, 17 Old Testament prophets that were God's word. They did miraculous works to prove they were from God. And, um, and here's the cool thing. That was in the past. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times in various ways. But in these days, these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So Jesus is his word. I, I, the, the quote in John 1 is, the word was with God, the word was God, the word is God. Like Jesus is the word. When Jesus came, he fulfilled the word. He brought the word because Jesus represented the word to us in the flesh. We get to experience Jesus in his word because he is the word of God. He is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament word, and he has become that, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. I could go on and on about this one. All right, so Jesus made the universe. Did you know that? Like when you read scripture, like Jesus, he's going about to get into an argument because the Jews were trying to discredit Jesus. They were like, nah, he was a good guy. Maybe he taught some good stuff. Maybe he was a prophet. I don't know. Maybe he was an angel. Maybe. But they would never call him who he actually was. He was God. He was there at the beginning. His word spoke into all creation, the universe, you and me, that Jesus was there. Okay? This is who he is. So he is the word. We understand the word. Now, you say, some people use this verse and they take it out of context. They say, in the past God spoke through ancestors through prophets that they say, then there's no more prophecy or there's no more prophets. But we actually see throughout the whole New Testament, there's the gift of prophecy and how it works and functions in the body of Christ. That God still wants to speak into our lives in the current present situations that you're in, okay? So he still speaks, which is awesome. The Son is is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Oh, do we have an hour? <laughs> it's right? Do you, I like, it's oozing with richness, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's like, this is the gold chest about Jesus. You know, like, you just can keep digging and digging and digging. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. Have you ever looked at the actual physical sun on a sunny day? I just want to see who's blind in the room, right? Like, it's not good to look directly at the sun. They say, don't look at the sun. Remember the eclipse? You had to have your special glasses. Your dog had to have its special glasses, right? Everybody had to have special glasses. Why? Because you're not supposed, nobody's supposed to look at the sun. The frogs, nobody, no animal. Like, don't look at the sun because the sun will, like, burn your retinas, right? It'll actually injure you. And so what do we actually see every single day is not the direct sun. We see the rays of the sun, don't we? We see the effects of the sun. We see the sunlight coming. Like that sunlight, the radiance off of that physical sun is the sun. That's what he's saying. Like Jesus, when he was here in flesh, and now that he's exalted in heaven, he is the radiance of God's glory. So he is God's glory. Does that make sense? It's not separate. It's the same thing. The sun and the rays from the sun are the sun. And he's the exact representation of his being. So when we read about Jesus in the Gospels, we are reading God. It, it, he was the physical manifestation of the presence of God and all of his character, all of his being, all of his actions, every word he spoke. Jesus is God. You with me? Okay. Some of you are. Okay. So that is who he is, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now wait, he created all things? Yes, he, his word spoke and he created all. And after he created, he sustains all things by that same word. He creates and he sustains. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. 
So after he died on the cross, paid for all of our sins, when we confess and we believe that he is the Son of God, we get to live under that purification of our sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he is now ascended, and that's where he is sitting. God's glory, Jesus there. You with me? All right. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Now he gets into a discussion, okay? Here's the cool thing about Hebrews. We're going to read as much Old Testament as we are New Testament because Hebrews quotes Old Testament all the time. So I love Hebrews because we're getting both. Isn't that cool? It's like when you get to go to a buffet and you get the shrimp and the corn dogs. You kidding me, right? (laughs) The fair and high class all in the same place, right? Like, There's nothing wrong with that. Are you judging me? Am I being judged in this moment? All right. So, some of you are saying amen. I'm about to say other things. I'm going to stop right now. All right. So he became much superior to the angels. So why, why the discussion about the angels, right? Why? Because there was a discussion about the angels. The, uh, the writer is answering the question, well, isn't Jesus just one of the angels? Like he's this angelic being that came and did this stuff, but he's not actually God. He's just an angel that came and did this, right? And why is that important? Well, it's still important today because there are certain religions that call themselves Christians that actually believe this still. They believe Jesus was just an angel that God chose. You're going to be a son and you're going to do this stuff and when you're in heaven, you're, you're still an angel. Actually, it, I could go deep into this, but the Mormons, that's a part of their belief. The Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, like just so you know, if you come from those backgrounds, they're wrong. They're off. They're off. And it's not just kind of off. They're off, off. It's, it's a different gospel, okay? So you have to be careful about these things um, when you're looking at this stuff. Because what he's saying is, no, Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than the prophets, right? He isn't just another prophet. He's greater than. He's greater than the angels. He's not an angel. He's greater than. And then he goes in all these Old Testament proofs. Who, what other angel said, sit at my right hand? Like, what other angel did he say? You know, he's like, Jesus isn't an angel. Because he ends with this. Are not all angels just ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So he gets to the end and he's like, this is what angels do. This isn't what Jesus is. And, uh, and I'm not going to go into a full thing on angels uh, this morning. But angels are created beings. Jesus isn't. Angel, the number of angels is the same as it was then as it is today. And they have assignments. And they have personal assignments for believers, is what he's saying. Like, you have an angel assigned to you. Isn't that crazy to think about? Like, when you study this kind of stuff, it's pretty amazing. Our family has seen angels do things in our family and protect and heal all sorts of crazy things we've seen in angelic stuff. When we die, just so you know, we do not become angels. Angels already are. We are created beings. We get to be with Jesus. That's the better place, y'all. And in the end, we as humans resurrected become higher than the angels. So I don't want to be an angel. I want to be better than. I want to be in a glorified body in eternity with my heavenly father, Amen. with Jesus. Like, and so, so Jesus is greater than angels. Now, let me just get to the practical real quick. Here's the practical. In all of this, in the quoting the Old Testament scriptures, we understand that Jesus is greater. But today, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're wrestling with. I don't, you know, I don't know what you're bringing in the door with you. But what, if this really is Jesus, and what we're about to learn through this whole series, if this really is him, this is what I want you to know today. You can, you can write this down. I already said that that Jesus is the creator and sustainer of all things. Which means he is the creator and sustainer of you. Do you need to help do you need any help sustaining some things in your life? Oh yes. Right? I know there's people here who have health issues. it should give you hope to know that Jesus created you. He knows your body. 
There are times he works in healing, miraculous ways. Sometimes he allows things in our bodies to not heal. I can't tell you why. I can't tell you, you know, like, there's some things I've seen happen that I, I'm going to have questions when I get to heaven. Probably when I get to heaven, they're going to seem pretty small. But, but I can rest in the fact that Jesus is the creator and sustainer of all things. So that means he created me and he can sustain me. He can hold you and he can hold your stuff. Why? Because Jesus is greater than your stuff. And we can rest in that. Sometimes, like we look for answers. Sometimes it's like, I need to know, I need to know. And there's a lot of things in life, I'll just tell you, you're not going to know that we're not going to know this side of heaven. But what I can know is that Jesus is greater. He created me, and he can sustain me in this. And today, no matter what I'm going through, I'm going to love God, I'm going to love others. And it's that simple. And let's not overcomplicate it. Today, I want us to keep us that simple. And we're going to learn how he created us and how he sustains us. We're going to learn more about Jesus in this series. Um, And I'm hoping you're going to find some hope and encouragement in it. In a moment, we're going to respond to worship, and we're just going to just be in God's presence a little bit. But I just want to spend just some time in, in prayer first and, uh, and let God speak. So, so God, as we take, take a moment after just hearing a lot, I mean, just hearing about your word and, and trying to start to unpack uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and We want to just hang the hook, hang our hats on the hook of Jesus, you're greater, and that you sustain us this morning. So Holy Spirit, whatever you want to say, just just lead us in this time. I want to talk to those of you who are believers. You've put your trust in Christ. Uh, Maybe today... God already said something to you. I don't need to say anything else. Maybe today you just, like, God's already just got you right in your heart and Holy Spirit's kind of said something to you. Just hold on to that in your heart. Just let let that kind of permeate you right now. If he hasn't said anything yet to you and you're just kind of just being here right now in this moment, here's my question for you. In what ways are you trying to sustain yourself? Like today, what ways are you just, you're just trying to work really hard to sustain yourself or just to keep yourself going or to... I need you to know today, God is big enough to hold you. Jesus has already created and can sustain you. So I'm giving you permission to stop trying this morning. And maybe give it to the God who's holy, who's set apart, who's otherness, and who loves you. So if that's you today, I would just encourage you. We're going to sing the song we just learned a moment ago singing about his holiness, his greatness, and saying, Jesus, it's you alone. It's not me. It's not what I can do. It's not how I can hold myself. It's not how I can say. It's Jesus, you alone, okay? And maybe while we sing, you, you just give that to him, okay? If you don't have a relationship with Jesus this morning, here's the good news. For God so loved the world, God so loved you, he gave his one and only son, Jesus. Jesus lived. He walked on this earth. He was the exact representation of God on earth. And he died on the cross. He chose to die on the cross to pay for your debt of sin. If you believe him, you confess him, you can be forgiven and start that relationship today. And if that's you, I'm going to pray right now. And you can pray and you can invite him in and give him your life. Okay? So let's just take a moment and bow right now. If that's you, just pray wherever you're at. You can just say something like this. You say, God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. 
to die on the cross to pay for my sins. I've been trying to pay for them myself and I give myself to you now. I confess that Jesus is your son and that he rose again so that I can have real life again. So be my Lord. I confess Jesus my Savior and I give you my life. Come into me. Forgive me. Holy Spirit, enter into my heart, my life, my mind. I surrender to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray alone. Amen. Amen. And if you if you